Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to Bad Sydney Crime Festivals 2022. Welcome also to those joining us on Zoom, including viewers throughout New South Wales who are watching from your local library or from home, courtesy of your local library. Today we are on Gadigal land and as we gather to share stories and knowledge, let us reflect on the rich history of storytelling in this place. I pay my respect to elders past and present and to any First Nations people in the audience today. So just some housekeeping matters. If you could all please make sure that your phones are switched to silent or turned off. Don't record the session, please. If you're taking photos, please turn off your flash. And for anybody who is on social media, please feel free to share on um, Twitter at Bad Crime Sydney, hashtag Bad Crime Sydney 22. In the unlikely event of an emergency evacuation, we will leave through the door through which you entered and exit the building via the Mitchell vestibule main doors and down the front door stairs to an assembly point in the domain and the security guards will direct you. So I'm very delighted to welcome you today to our session. I wanna start by remembering an article in the Daily Telegraph in August, 2014, when Islamophobia claimed its very first mannequin victim. Sporting a roughly drawn on beard and thobe, his blonde hair slightly exposed under a black turban, he stood in front of a mixed goods store in the Western Sydney suburb of Lakemba. What happened was that he came, became immortalized to the Muslim Western Sydney community when the Daily Telegraph's columnist, Tim um, Blair, went out and did a going native type opinion piece. He ventured out to the suburb of Lakimba, which he dubbed Sydney's Muslim land. And the byline to his piece read, the Daily Telegraph's Tim Blair spent 24 hours in Lakimba where a pervasive monoculture has erased the traditional way of life. And the article invoked every possible racial motive about Muslims in Western Sydney, Anglo decline, Muslim takeover, gangs, extremism, monolingual, mon monocultural ghetto. And I remember very clearly him writing about visiting a hotel in which there wasn't even a Gideon's Bible. It really was the perfect example of how Western Sydney has been constructed, particularly those areas with high Muslim and Arab populations as Muslim ghetto, gritty, violent, the site of media and political moral panics. And today I wanna to explore what it means to write from, in and about those geographies, which are both physical and real and also imagined and constructed. And to do that, I am honored to be chairing a panel with three of really the country's best writers and thinkers, Sarah Ayoub, Michael Mohammed Ahmed and Amani Haydar. And I wanna start by asking each of you what Western Sydney means to you. Um. It's home, it's the most vibrant um, community. It's a place where um, I always feel safe. That's probably the, which, which is ironic given the lens by which the rest of the world sees it. But I feel safer in Western Sydney walking there at night, even by myself, than I would feel anywhere else in this country. Sorry, like this, sorry. Um, yeah, me too. But I also want to reflect on something that I was thinking about and writing about recently. When I worked in a city law firm and I was a young, bright eyed, bushy tailed lawyer waiting to take on, you know, take on the world and really grow my wealth and sense of power and sense of independence. All the young lawyers I met were aspiring to move over the bridge. And that signified um, a move that represented all the success that you'd earned for yourself, the networks that you'd built, the influence that you were able to have. And I got asked by someone who lived in the same suburb I lived in at the time, which was in Southwest Sydney, but not as far West as I live now. Um, when are you going to move over the bridge? Are you planning to move over the bridge? I'm going to move my whole family <laughs> over the bridge. And it struck me as very odd because I thought where we lived was quite nice. And it wasn't until later on that I began to reflect on that. And then I ended up moving further west. I left legal practice and she became a partner and, you know, continued that trajectory. And I checked her Facebook <laughs> recently and she's moved over the bridge. So I was quite happy for her, but I thought about what that meant and how the Western Sydney art spaces and communities that I've been able to connect with over the past few years have enriched me in a way that my office job never did and satisfied something in me, including my pull to create and my pull to connect with people um, that I did not get in, you know, level 32 
um, of the tower that we were in. So I've grown a massive sense of appreciation for where I am and how to embrace and exist happily in your context and your surroundings without always gazing longingly somewhere else. Um, uh, I, you know, the article that Radha was talking about, uh, there was a, and the mannequin in that article that she was referring to uh, had like a, it was like a texted bid on the mannequin and it had a prayer cap. And so the Daily Telegraph had taken a photo of that mannequin and underneath they described it as crudely Islamified. And uh, I'm crudely Islamified. <laughs> um, and when I think of Western Sydney, I think crudely and proudly Islamified. <laughs> so um, there's no escaping the fact that Western Sydney is racialized, it's classed, it's gendered. And very often when we gather in these um, middle-class, you know, writers' festival context, and we talk about race, um, as we have for so many years, inevitably somebody writes to us afterwards and says, oh, you're exaggerating, or you're just talking at it from an ivory, you know, point of view, ivory tower, um, it doesn't really happen. So I actually wanted to ask each of you to share with you um, a moment where you have experienced that racialization because of where, um, because of that, you know, connection with Western Sydney, really so that people can understand in a vivid way how these wider discourses infiltrate daily life. And I can start off by giving an example. Amani and I worked in law together, actually at the same law firm, but I remember vividly when I started working as a lawyer in Sydney in the office um, and I had to, I was sent to Parramatta Corp for one of our cases and one of the lawyers there said, make sure you take a gun for protection. It was, it was just this idiotic comment, um, but it was always this disdain for anyone who had to go venture out to Parramatta um, to ghetto land. Um, and I remember that very vividly in my very first year of law here. Um, so all the pa panellists here can attest to the fact that, that there never is one incident. It's a series of microaggressions that you face all the time. Um, for, I, I should probably add a disclaimer that I don't wear a hijab. I'm relatively white passing and I'm not a male. So the um, experiences that I've had have been fairly tame compared to that of other people in my community. But there's one event, one incident that I will never forget because it happens on Boxing Day and I wrote about it in Arab Australian Other. And Boxing Day to me is a time of festivity. It's in summer. We were having a, it was a party at somebody's house. I was in a good mood. I was in high spirits. My entire family was there. The stress of Christmas was behind me. And I was standing around in a conversation while a white man was talking about the merits of his new hometown um, where, where he had moved. And he's like, oh, it's a 10 minute commute from my job. He said something that I can't remember. And then the next thing that he said was that there were no fucking lebs there. And I'm Lebanese. And the fact that my people around me knew that I was Lebanese and nobody said anything is something that will stay with me forever. The fact that this guy was so comfortable to say something so not just moronic, but completely and utterly racist. Nobody called him out on it, but the fact that he felt comfortable to say it in a social setting will stay with me forever. And it just demonstrates the way in which we had been dehumanized year after year. And we just learned to live with it. I think the example that I find maybe the most personally um, memorable are the things that happened early on when the war on terror was picking up and I was still a high school student and in a, I, was, I happened to be in a school where there weren't many other Muslim or, or Arab or Lebanese students. And what happens in that situation is that despite your particular circumstances and despite your particular experiences, you become the token individual. And then by association, the spokesperson for things that are happening um, around us. And I wasn't, I wasn't literate enough around these issues back then to be able to articulate my discomfort with it. And I just put it down to, oh, people are curious, people want to ask questions. But now that I understand that broader context and how that was influencing the way people were perceiving me and the way that, you know, other young people were 
um, communicating with me and their expectations that we provide answers and explanations when that's not our job. And we might not even have them. I didn't, I didn't know. I didn't know enough to even explain anything about my religion or any social issue or political issue. I was just there to, you know, get the marks and move on with my life. Um, so I think for me, it was those, those microaggressions that take place in the school environment. They were the ones that probably had the most impact. And then later on, I think with a greater sense of self and a greater sense of literacy around it, I was less pressured to respond. I do not feel that it's up to another person to define the conversation that I'm having. Um, I, I, you know, Sarah, like you, you make the point that there's like hundreds of these examples. I have hundreds. Uh, so I'm going to give you a random story, just one out of many. Um, but I remember I was standing on uh, the traffic light at Wiley Park train station, so on King George's Road. And there were these two kids about a meter away from me and they had pebbles in their hands and they were pegging them at the cars going by. And somehow one of those kids pegged a pebble so effectively that it hit a semi-trailer going by and it caught the attention of the driver. And so he pulled over and if anyone knows that section of the road, there's nowhere to stop. So he just stopped and let the traffic stop too. And he got out and those two kids said to each other, Isha, bro, Isha, which means he, he saw us, he's coming. So they sprinted off. And I'm standing on the light, minding my own business. I was about 19 at the time. So only a few years older than those kids. And you know when someone's walking to you and you can kind of sense, like, uh, <laughs> he, he thinks it's me. And so I, I gave him a, a kind of a smile and, and I was like, they went that way. Didn't hear me. Walked straight up to me, said, Lebanese prick. And he punched me straight in the face. And he was about twice my size. I was only about 55 kilos at that time. He was about six foot four, over a hundred kilos. And then he just got in his uh, truck and he drove on. No one out of all the traffic that he obstructed got out to help. They just kept going when he left. And I remember walking home from there, crossing the road and just walking home with this throbbing face. And you know, right now, uh, the arts community, I don't know how many of you are in the arts community, but it's quite a sensitive space. It's the kind of space where if you talk too loudly or if you say the wrong word or you ask the wrong question, you can find yourself in a lot of trouble. Someone would be very happy to go on social media and call you a predator. But at that time, those kinds of experiences were so normal that I wasn't even upset. I just expected those kinds of things to happen. So I just walked home with this throbbing face. I was like, ah, well, that's life. I got home and my dad saw my cheeks swelled up and he said what happened and I, I recounted the story to him and I'll never forget his reaction he laughed and said tough luck mm. that is the perfect segue Muhammad into talking about Western Sydney and youth because well Sarah and Muhammad your books you know your your young adult books um Muhammad you know your trilogy the tribe the lebs which is set at Punchbowl Boys High you know, these are these are stories about young kids growing up in these demonized, racialized, classed suburbs, having to encounter this kind of racism and think it's normal because of the way they look and because of the association with these sort of stereotypes and and raced, um, you know, images. So I wanted to ask you about. Um, well, I wanted to, to really set this conversation up by a story recently that broke, um, you know, in the media, and it just was one article and then went away about a grammar school in Sydney where there's this been a torrent of horrific misogynistic um you know abuse on on a chat forum at one of I think it's Knox Grammar maybe or one of the top private schools um you know we get these stories every now and then and then it fizzles out and goes away compare that to the hysteria around in 2017 when Hertzville boys a group of Muslim um young boys declined to shake hands at a graduation ceremony with um, um female teachers but instead placed their hands on their chest as a mark of respect um and the story went to national attention the Australian the New South Wales um, education minister was investigating and seeking legal advice if this was against anti-discrimination laws we had interventions from you know every single politician you can think of it it was scaled up to this moral panic around radicalized you know misogynistic youth the difference in the way that white kids get away with misogyny and racism and homophobia and get a free pass compared to the young kids growing up in western sydney and how you address that in your writing <laughs> well i'll give a concise answer um uh, the, over the last few weeks of uh, 
preparing for this event and the media interviews that I've done, there's been an observation from some of the journalists I've been talking to that uh, there isn't really a body of work of what we would describe as crime fiction among Arab Australian and Muslim Australian writers. And by extension of that, actually there's a very small body of work by writers of color and First Nations writers. We, we don't do a lot of that kind of writing. And uh, the question is why? This has been coming up uh, for the last couple of weeks. And I've been thinking about it. And the, the closest explanation I can offer is that there is a significant body of work that already exists in Australia that I would describe in the genre of crime fiction that is out there. And it's called the Australian news media. And so what we have to do literally is write anti-crime fiction. We have to write works that are complex and nuanced and humanizing to provide a counterbalance and a counter narrative to the one that's been fed to the majority of Australians. It's actually perfectly um, exemplified in a story from I think 2014. Um, anybody who knows the way that the news media works knows that, you know, if you look at media theory, that it's not just the angle from which you report an event, but the way that it is framed and the way that we emphasize certain details and certain characteristics to construct what Michael Schutzen says is a morality battle between antagonists. And the really interesting thing for me, as I have observed this from being a teenager, reading the newspaper, wanting to be a journalist someday, to the person that I am today, is one story of a, a white Australian news reporter who had covered some of the trials around the, the gang rapes in the year 2000, and then wrote a story in 2014 about a woman named Louise who was allegedly raped by, and they abbreviated the term in the newspaper to Merck's, and it standard it stood um, it was Middle Eastern raping C U N T S, and this story was a huge double page spread in the newspaper, and there was so much conversation about it because it just kept fueling that moral panic. You know, we were constructed as folk devils, and the fact that not a single thing was fact checked in that story just demonstrates what you were saying about this crime fiction, that we can't publish news. It is the antithesis of what news is supposed to be when you don't fact check a story. This story went through the multiple gatekeepers of the newsroom. It went from the journalist to the sub editor to the page editors and so on. And it went to print. Not a single person bothered to fact check with the police, with any other people who could corroborate this woman's story. And it turned out that this woman belonged to a white supremacist organization and had been going around giving talks, demonizing our community. And I think about this all the time because I wanted to work in this industry. This was an industry that I wanted. I wanted to be a journalist from the age of 10 and I felt driven out of that industry before I even had the chance to work in it because I did not want to participate in the ongoing demonization of my community or any other community that we deemed worthy of demonization at the time. I write fiction not because it is my passion. I write young adult novels not because I love to do it in the same way that I love news. I do it because it was the only way for me to make sense of everything that I was going through. And if I could save a teenage girl or a teenage boy from the heartache and the ostracization that I felt as a young person growing up in this country, then if I could save one person, it's worth it. So when we talk about that, sorry, and Mohammed and Amani, about this um, tension between being writers and having this burden of representation, how do you, all the three of you, negotiate that? Because we, we have... We, we can't, we don't have the freedom to create individual characters um, 
you know, and that's the joy of being a writer, the characterization process, because you know that it will always be seen as an ethnography, as an, as, you know, as a, a work of sociology, rather than a work of fiction or creativity. And even, Amani, in writing a non-fiction book, there is still the risk that it will be seen as the quintessential Muslim story. Um, so how do you navigate that as writers? Yeah, so everything that Mohammed and Sarah just described is the context that I was living in and grew up in. And it was the context that I had to navigate when I lost my mum to domestic violence in 2015. She was murdered in her home by my dad. And that kind of crime has such a huge effect on all of the people um, involved. And it turned my life upside down. I was five months pregnant at the time. I had two younger sisters who were still living with my mum. I had a brother who was already incarcerated, who was dependent on our parents as well. And that responsibility all became mine. And we already know that we have a problem in relation to the reporting of uh, the deaths of women in Australia, um, especially when it's as a result of male violence. So there's that issue in terms of framing. And then for me, there was the additional concern that my mum's story would be understood through an Islamophobic lens and that her experience would be reduced to a cultural and religious experience rather than something that is part of the broader pattern of domestic violence in this country and which resembles a lot of the similar um, cases that were taking place uh, very frequently that year actually. My mum was the 30th or 31st of 81 women to lose their lives violently in Australia that year. So there was nothing exceptional about what had happened to us and nothing particular to our cultural religious context, but that's still featured. It's still featured in some of the public conversation. It featured in the Facebook comments, that's for sure. People forget that victims of crime are real and they're sitting there and we have access to Facebook and we can see what you're saying. Um, so there were some horrendous things. There were some sort of fringe websites um, that described um, the murder in the terms of, um, Muslim man murders his wife for, for refusing to pass the salt. And that's incredibly disrespectful and an undignified way to report on the death of a woman. Um, so within that context, I had also just recently started wearing a hijab. So I was hyper-conscious of my visibility now as a Muslim woman. And there was a two-year wait between the murder and the trial. So I knew we would end up on the television screen again. My mum's death was on front pages of the newspapers that we walked past um, on the very first day. So being aware of the lack of empathy that the media has towards um, my community meant that that whole experience was harder to navigate than what it would have already been. And on top of that, I had concerns about how that would trickle down into the um, reporting around my dad's trial. And, you know, um, Arab men are frequently uh, demonized and dehumanized and uh, depicted in a way that is um, often subject to very tight stereotypes. And I knew my dad didn't fit those stereotypes necessarily. And I wondered how that would complicate um, the trial. And there were, there were a bunch of different things that I write about, about how complex and nuanced our situation was. And none of that complexity and that nuance was really able to be captured by anyone else anyone who commented on what was happening or even in the courtroom itself. So for me, the act of writing nonfiction about those experiences is also still an act of resistance against our narratives being told for us in a way that doesn't recognize our humanity, humanity appropriately and in a way that doesn't capture the full depth and complexity of our experiences. Mohammed, did you have anything to add? Um, all I have to add to that is you should read Amani's book, The Mother Wound, which is about that experience she just uh, recounted. Mm. And you should also read Randa's book, Coming of Age in the War on Terror, which looks at that entire period, that entire generation. I think it's the perfect companion piece to really any Arab Australian book you read as a, as a kind of fun, a foundational text to understand the context in which all of our writing emerges. And especially if you have young people that, you, that you've got in your lives, you should check out Sarah Ayub's new book, uh, The Cult of Romance. Uh, which talks about it from that younger lens and communicates directly to our to the next generation. But Muhammad, you know, speaking back to this idea of burden, I think out of all of us, when I when I consider the reviews and the commentary around your books, you cop it the most in terms of um, this is so confronting. This, I mean, the, it's almost as though the reviewers 
struggle with the uh, struggle with the fact that they enjoy reading it it's almost as though like they feel guilty can you talk us through some of the ways that your work has been received because it's not that you aren't free of the burden of representation it's that your readers can't seem to get past the fact that this isn't a representative um you know of a community or of a group mm. um thank you Rhonda. um so you know, it's tricky because on the one hand, we as writers and as storytellers and as public intellectuals, our responsibility is not to tell a positive story. Our responsibility is to tell a complex and sophisticated story, especially if we're doing our jobs well. And that means that we do have to be able to get down and dirty with the with the work and with the stories that we want to share. And there is antisocial behavior in our community. Uh, uh, Amani's father is a man who identified, if I'm if I'm right, as being from an Arab and a Muslim background. That's the reality of the situation. How do we talk about it while at the same time not uh, enabling our critics to use that uh, as an excuse to justify their hatred and their Islamophobia? Um, and this is how I've been able to reconcile it in the last couple of years, is that it's not my responsibility to, re to say, the, say things that uh, affirm or dismiss the position of somebody who's racist that's not my burden that's on you as the reader and as the public and if you're a moron and you can't read in a complex and nuanced way that's your problem it's not my problem uh, i quickly want to add um my stories are often referred to as confront uh, as com confronting and controversial uh when i when i when i wrote about my experiences at punchball boys in my book the labs the, the school I went to was surrounded by barbed wires and cameras. Uh, it was uh, literally referred to by the boys in my school as Punchbowl Prison. It was built like a prison, especially when you were sprinting from that three-story building across the oval to Jig School. Um, but uh, the, the thing about it is that I remember witnessing firsthand uh, incidents where young Pacifica men and young Arab men uh, stabbing each other. I witnessed my friends get stabbed in the head by another boy because someone's phone got stolen, for example. I witnessed acts of extreme violence. I witnessed extreme forms of homophobia and misogyny uh, when, when those boys were outside of the community. And so whenever somebody has a sulk about my work and says to me, it was confronting, I'm like, well, you got to sit in your bed and read about it. Try being me, try living through it. If you think reading about it is confronting, try actually being a lab in the post 9-11 era. And isn't the issue that it's the pathologizing? It's not that you are describing behavior that doesn't happen in white communities either. It's the fact that it's essentialized. So you, I think I did a whole PhD and then at the end of it, I was looking at Islamophobia from the point of view of the perpetrators. I realized that I had a very simple conclusion, which is, Muslims just the right racism really is the right to be an asshole not to be a Muslim asshole like you know like it's just it's not the fact that that person is doing the behavior because they're Muslim or because they're Lebanese you know and so this equal opportunity right to behave in 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 you know as you behave because of a multitude of factors not because of an essentialized cultural or religious identity and that's what really that our work is trying to address um I want to shift a little bit and uh, Amani when I think about like recommending your books every time I recommend your book sorry I pause in the words that I'm going to use you know I, I've never said you're going to enjoy this you know you have to read it it's a page turner and there's this tension isn't there because you, you know you wrote to me that you've never seen your writing in the context of true crime fiction so what is that limit you know in that genre as a survivor um, about having you know the risk of having your stories sensationalized you know, can you write a book from a place of trauma? What are the risks in that? You know, you know, who deserves your vulnerability? Is it empowering, disempowering that process? How, how has that been for you? Yeah, so all of those different things that you just mentioned were considerations that went into my own decision-making and um, my thought process behind my book. I initially started writing for myself in a therapeutic context. I was given a journal by my first counsellor at the Homicide Victim Support Group. And that was a way for me to um, restructure some of my thoughts and begin a sort of healing process. And I then turned my attention to the trial and the opportunity, opportunity of writing a victim impact statement. And when I wrote my victim impact statement, there were all these things I wanted to say to my dad. And 
I knew, and I was a trained practicing lawyer at the time, I knew that parts of it weren't allowed and the rules didn't allow certain things. And I felt a bit frustrated about the evidence that I'd given. It wasn't enough. How could I sort of really tell the court something important and meaningful at the end of this trial to, to really do my mum uh, justice? And the pressure that was associated with writing that victim impact statement, I think it was the only thing I thought about for about two years. And the amount of writing that my brain produced during that period was enough to create a book. Um, but it was all still up here and I was afraid of engaging with the public about it. And it takes, it really is a process for victim survivors to begin sharing their story and identifying um, safe ways to do that. And I'm really interested in trauma-informed practice in the writing process and the creative arts. Um, because I think it is a tool that can be empowering, but it's not empowering if you're doing it on someone else's terms. And there has been so much work that I've done familiarizing myself with the work of Our Watch, understanding um, the issues around reporting, the issues around um, coercive control and all of those, those different contextual things. And then on top of that, in top of, on top of coming to terms with a homicide in my life, having to build my literacy around race in order to address the issues that we're talking about today and to do it sensitively and to do to to feel empowered by that language as well because i i we know the risks and we know how other stories have been told and we know how we've been viewed because we've seen it we've seen enough evidence of it to know um so in the end it has been an empowering process for me it has been a way of um really resisting the silencing that took place at the time when we were going through all of those events, it has been a way of resisting the um, ways the rules of evidence constricted um, the storytelling that could take place in the courtroom. Um, so there was evidence I wanted to give and it was inadmissible and I got cross-examined and I felt like a deer in headlights. And I can only imagine what the experience is like for people who are completely unfamiliar with the legal system or the courtroom. And I was able to have that evidence in my book instead. That wouldn't, I wouldn't have been able to do that if I didn't have the this the literacy and the access to support and things like that beforehand um and I took my time with it so I think that's really important too and yeah I I I do feel that at the, at the you know on this side of it it has been rewarding and empowering it has given my mum's family a sense of closure I think that's very powerful you don't always get that from the legal system especially when the focus is on um, punishing the offender and not healing the victims as the, and that's what we have in our legal system so for me it's it's all those things thank you Amani speaking about trauma I think um even even sorry your book cult of romance it's you know all of your work we, we forget often that when we're talking from places of Western Sydney, there is still this intergenerational trauma of migration, of escaping, um, you know, civil war, of the in-betweenness of cultures, living between cultures, which I think you address so beautifully in the cult of romance. I think it was just so vivid, vividly um, realised that it, it wasn't your typical, you know, story of, of feeling, you know, torn between two cultures. You really addressed it in a very nuanced way. Um, and I wanted all of you just to speak really about how, there, there is this sense that you are writing from Western Sydney because this is what we're talking about today. And so often people forget. I mean, when you think about kids in classrooms, we forget that a lot of kids in Western Sydney in those classrooms have family in countries where there is still war happening and teachers forget that, the media forgets that. Um, so how do you sort of negotiate that with your writing and, 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 and really address that with your characters? Um, the one thing that my fiction, I hope, does is remind young people and young girls in particular about their worth because I felt so stripped of my self-worth for a long time and I remember I married a white man and I remember being excited not because I was getting married but because I could change my name and in changing my name I could hide a part of my identity and now in my mid-30s I think back to how I feel sorry for that girl and uh, I feel sorry for my parents who had to hear me be excited about that. It was almost like I had to throw a part of me away in order to belong in this colony and I don't want young people to feel that way. I write those stories, I write them the way that I do in order to remind my reader, A, if they're from those communities that 
no one can take away their worth, but B, if they're outside of those communities to tread carefully, to tread sensitively, because you don't know what is, you're taking a news story or a stereotype at face value and you don't realize that there are real life daily consequences for people living in those news stories, represented in those news stories. And so um, I, I'd like to think that, you know, as writers, we don't, we shouldn't have that, we should have the freedom to write like any other writer, but we don't always have that freedom. And I don't know if that answers your question, no. but. <laughs> um, we're we're going to kill each other with our Arab politeness. <laughs> um, I, well, I, so what I take away from the question is how, how we write with nuance uh, about um, our communities. And because we're talking about myths and realities of uh, Middle Eastern crime in Western Sydney, that's the name of this panel, I, I feel like that's the context in which I want to try to answer the question. So on November 3rd, 1998, this, this, what I'm about to tell you is a, a moment that actually changed my life, changed the way I see reality. But I, I, on November 3rd, 1998, there was a front page article in the Daily Telegraph. I still have it. Um, it's uh, the headline is dial a gun. And then the subheading is Lebanese gang says it's easier than buying a pizza. They can get a gun easier than getting a pizza. And the the context in which this article emerges is two significant incidents that take place in southwestern Sydney. First, the drive by shooting. I don't know if you remember, Sarah, of Lakemba police station by members of the, the DK gang, is a Danny Karam's gang. And the second was a shooting, a murder of a young boy from Korean background named Edward Lee in Punchbowl. And both incidents, Bob Carr was the premier at the time, described as incidents involving a Middle Eastern gang. That's the context in which this front page article appears. And on that front page article, in addition to the headline, is a photograph of all these lab boys doing their Biggie and Tupac gangster signs and wearing their Nike and Feline Adidas outfits. Now, anybody with half a brain and anybody who knew the community really well, which we did, could tell you that those boys were taking the piss. What kind of a moron would be involved in organized crime, involved in murders and shootings, and just expose themselves to the Daily Telegraph and be happy to be on the front page? These boys were having a laugh. They were pretending to be gangsters and they concocted this story about how they were gangsters. They, the headline, the, the article talked about how they used their hand signals to communicate to each other when police are around. But if you saw the hand signals in the photo, they were just copying Biggie and Tupac. It was, based, it was the West Side sign. And so there's a name for this behavior in cultural theory. It's called protest masculinity. The symbolic assertion of power and aggression to compensate for marginalization. So when you are, when your community is being scrutinized, the assumption is that you would behave well, but there's a lot of evidence that shows that actually a lot of marginalized men will just play up the stereotype. So I just quickly wanna answer why that is. There's two explanations that I've read about. One is because it's actually empowering to scare white people. When white people are constantly demonizing you in the media, it's empowering to say, yeah, I am the monster you're saying I am, so stay away from me or I'll hurt you. That's our way of getting revenge. And the second way, is, the second reason these young men do it is because it's sexy. The girls in the neighborhood like it when, or, they, or at least the boys think the girls <laughs> like it when you're playing the wannabe gangster. I always think back to that, that time as well, because in the aftermath of Edward Lee's murder, the police who were trying to find the perpetrators went to the nearby shopping center of Bankstown Square and they laid 71 charges and made 24 arrests in one day. They just went to the shops and harassed young men of Middle Eastern appearance. But not only that, they had the mounted police and the dog squad there. What did you think that like was happening that you get the same police that you would have at a protest into a shopping center to harass teenage boys so in relation to you talked about 
young people having relatives overseas and being affected by war and how we don't, you know, as tight and as controlled as we believe our borders are, it doesn't stop experience from flowing over. It doesn't stop from love happening, you know, across those borders. It doesn't stop um, us from being impacted from by human by disasters, whether they're man-made or natural um, that are happening overseas. I, in... 2006, when I was about to sit the HSC, I lost my grandmother to an Israeli airstrike in the south of Lebanon in a very brief but very aggressive um, war. And I went on and I sat my trials the following week. And there was no understanding in my context of how something like that would affect you and how it did affect me. And well, I didn't even really acknowledge how it affected me until, you know, recently. And when I wrote about it in my book, I realized the magnitude of, of an event like that on a young person, we had a whole family evacuated living with us. They were Australian citizens who had moved back because they wanted to live in Lebanon, forced to come back. We had, um, we attended a mosque, um, event, a uh, commemoration that commemorated the deaths of over a hundred different individuals. And it was like a joint funeral for all their families um, in one week. So the effects of that violence were so profound, but there was no recognition for, of that in my um, surroundings, in my school environment. And later on, when I went on to um, work with young people in Western Sydney in Arabic speaking communities, I realized the extent of that because at that time we now had um, people from Iraq who had recently arrived and I sat down to work with a young boy and he was in year 10 and I said to him, oh, so we've got to come up with a story, you know, come up with a little poem. I'm sure you can write something. He said, I actually can't write anything. I'm like, no, no, write it in Arabic and I'll translate it for you. That's silly me. He said, no, I didn't get to go to school because of the war in Iraq. And so I can't write it in Arabic either. And that's the context that young people in Western Sydney might be living in. And then these expectations around behavior and how you present yourself and what kind of goals you can achieve um, imposed on them without anyone ever addressing um, some of those underlying experiences that really shape the way that you're going to engage with the world, your sense of safety in your surroundings, your ability to connect and express yourself. Um, so I think that that really um, represents for me the immensity of that impact and how um, war degrades us as a whole. And also what when we talk about crime and Middle Eastern crime, we erase the criminality of Western settler colonialism, the criminality that is happening on a daily basis to our communities around the world, to Indigenous people on this land. And then the media and politicians have the audacity to attempt to civilise us, to discipline us, when we are living daily with the impact of Western violence and crime and criminality. And then we expect young people to, um, to be polite and well-mannered and, you know, we scale up their, you know, you know, teenage behavior into something much larger than it is yeah and the lack of accountability that we have to just accept so lack of accountability for my grandmother's murder yeah. um this boy having a lack of ac accountability or never experiencing any kind of accountability or closure for the fact that his life and the life of so many others around him had been um torn upside down without any Re I don't even know how to describe it reason <laughs> what reason could there be you know um no accountability for the impact of um, the decisions made by people in power um, to destroy our communities. Um, we're going to go for questions either from the audience or Zoom. Do we have any? If not, I've got so many other questions. <laughs> uh, yes, so you'll just need to wait for a microphone, please. Is this correct? Thank you. I just wanted to pick up on, um, um, so it's, there's so many important themes there, just on what Sarah Ayub said about the, um, um, the Sydney Morning Herald, which is, of course, not a tabloid and, generally speaking, considered a table of paper of record, and the story by Paul Sheehan, which was bumped out of his usual column and onto the front page about um, 
supposedly um, the activities of Arab rape gangs in Sydney, or Middle East rape gangs in Sydney, and of course it was a totally fake story. Um, I think that's actually a really important um, moment in contemporary Australian journalism, um, which tends to be just um, uh, very quickly, oh, well, the story was pulled. Um, there's so many interesting ramifications on that. And um, I would say that I myself, do you remember Turkana, Turkana was fighting the good fight in, on social media when it happened? <laughs> Um, and uh, there was one woman, I, I'm ashamed, of, I've forgotten her name, but she was from the gay and lesbian media. And she was actually the first person to put up just on social media, I do not, I have this, this is, and this problems with this story. Um, so it was, um, it was pretty disgraceful how Paul Sheen was able to, uh, well, he actually shows us what the middle ground is um, with that story. Um, and it also, um, I felt the, the whole way that the story was presented, it went without comment and she and Wood have, might have got away with it, except that he also attacked the New South Wales police and the effective pushback came back from them. So it, it's just, as I say, um, that thank you for, for bringing up that story. And I think it's um, uh, something that a whole lot of issues there that we still need to think about. I think when we risk rewriting, thank you for saying that, but in every day, we are risk if we don't call things out, we are risking allowing certain people to rewrite history. You know, uh, I, I wrote recently, very recently, I'll say, say quickly, um, this piece on a movie that was uh, the number one movie on Netflix in 95 countries in the world. And it was uh, uh, like a love story, but it had a heavy militaristic angle. And it spoke about the war in Iraq, not as an unjustified invasion, but as a way for America, for soldiers to protect America from terrorists, to save women in Iraq, and featured a line in there by a soldier who said, let's go out and, and kill some goddamn Arabs. Imagine the young people watching that movie who did not live in that time when America invaded Iraq, who just took that movie and that narrative at face value. We are rewriting history every day. And it has real life consequences for people. Are there any other questions? Good morning. Hi. Um, I, I live and work in, I live on Marion Street, if you guys know that, if you're familiar with Bankstown, lovely to meet you all. Um, as someone that lives there, I kind of understand that othering that's gone on, uh, having grown up in the context there and you know, living through the portrayal of Arabs in our context and having gone through the Cronulla riots as a white person there um, and having people I know receive that text message, not participating, but receiving it because it kind of went around our whole school. Um, how much do you think the portrayal of Middle Eastern people in the media influenced the actions of the children in their formative years? Because I um, and do you think that reframing this discourse of the area that we live in will hope the dis uh, help the disenfranchised young men not fall into these stereotypes? It's a very loaded question, I know, and, and I apologise for that. Um, can, I, can I answer? Yeah. Um, so, you know, the text messages you're describing during the Cronulla riots, for those of you who don't remember, there were white Australians sending messages saying, come down to the beach for the riot. There were also Arab Australians saying, come down to the beach uh, for the revenge attacks. Um, I actually, believe it or not, had white Australian friends and Arab Australian friends. So I got text messages from both groups. I, I stayed at home and beat, beat up myself. Um, but, you know, uh, touching on what the sister said um, before your question about the construction of Arab and Muslim men in relation to sexually predatory behavior, that there's something inherently uh, misogynistic and patriarchal about our culture and our religion. And... And then thinking about Cronulla as well, the, the framing of the, the language around Cronulla riots, the word that seems to come up all the time when we're talking about uh, violence, uh, gangs, drugs, sexually predatory behavior is un-Australian. When young men of Arab and Muslim background behave this way, the behavior is called un-Australian. And I often think about this very famous Australian play and film called Puberty Blues that I grew up on, that I studied. If you watch it, it's set in Cronulla. It's about young white boys and they go down to the beach and they beat up lifeguards that's one of the most iconic scenes in the film there's this huge brawl between the, the white boys who surf and the lifeguards 
and they sexually harass the girls. As a matter of fact, there's one particular scene in Puberty Blues where they straight up rape a girl. We don't call that uh, text an Australian. In fact, we call it the opposite. We call it quintessentially Australian. Now, what were the boys who were going down to the beach who were Lebanese, Middle Eastern, what were they doing that gave rise to the Cronulla riots? What ignited the riots? Two things. One, that they were beating up lifeguards. And two, that they were harassing the girls. And what Gus and Hodge is an important anthropologist writes about in an important essay that you should all check out called Multiculturalism and the Ungovernable Muslim is that the reason why Australia found the behavior of these young boys so irksome, so offensive is not because it was un-Australian, but because it was too Australian. They had no shame. They were very much at home and they were behaving just like Australians are meant to behave. Um, thank you so much for all your contributions. Uh, the point I wanted to make is, Sarah, you mentioned that film. Um, I'm pretty sure it was called Purple Hearts. It went on Netflix and everyone was like, watch it. And then I saw a bit of the trailer and I was like, yuck, no. Um, <clears throat> but in terms of that film, a lot of the time when we see discussions about that in public, there's that constant argument that, oh, we need a place to start discussion or we need somewhere to spark this controversy or we need to see depictions of racist or problematic behaviour to be able to present the, the opposite of that argument or to present the correct way to do something. Um, I've often felt very uncomfortable in those conversations, but haven't yet found a, an accurate way to make the point that I think that that's unnecessary. So how necessary do you think in the art space, particularly because a lot of the time these are films or books or poems, how, how necessary do you think it is to have those problematic depictions in terms of starting a conversation? Is it necessary at all? I think it goes back to what Mohammed said earlier. You're not writing a sanitized story. Um, you're telling a truthful story. And at the same time, in doing that, you're resisting the stereotypes and the, the flattening that happens when a text like that um, is able to convey those things without anyone within the text challenging or questioning them and it's seen as romantic and cute and whatnot um so I do believe that you can bring ethics into any kind of art I think that's a responsibility that we take seriously the three of us um and I don't think it's necessary for the conversation in fact a better conversation will happen if the complexity exists within the text because you're able to then address those issues in a far more detailed and elaborate way. And I know in writing my own book, I had to tell an unflattering story about my own family, about my own relatives and the people who raised me. And at the same time in doing that, there was a sense of dignity because the truth was far more complicated than what was ever seen from the outside. Um, so I think, I think truth is sort of the antidote to those bad texts that are not um, able to, that don't bother or that have an agenda, I mean sometimes they do, um, don't bother to actually capture reality and they rewrite history as Sarah said. I think also just to pick up on what you were saying, um, there is a difference between writers who write for a white normative audience um, that's in, that's done in such a transparent way it's done very cynically it's done for the mainstream and that's when you usually get your airport trashy novel which confirms every single stereotype and usually makes the person millions of dollars anyway but it's so transparent and then there are those writers like the ones here today who are aware that they are writing against white normativity against a white mainstream space in terms not just of readers but the publishing industry in terms of the reviewing industry you know, a, a, an industry that can't cope, for example, with more than one Arab or Muslim writer releasing a book in one month, because, you know, it's it's never, you can release 20 books by white writers, but, you know, three or four books by, you know, Arab or Muslim writers and the reviewing world, you know, can't deal with it, can't handle it. So they'll usually review them all in one article, you know, so, but there's a difference between writers who understand that and still write books nuanced and capable of negotiating that. Um, and then those who sell out to that industry. Do we have any questions from the Zoom audience? Okay, 
Um, while you still think of questions, there was one question that was burning for me that I didn't get a chance to talk about, which is um, very specifically about class and um, gender. Um, I wanted to ask you, Amani, how you were able to write such a feminist novel that really honoured your mother's dignity and agency when so much of these sort of um, kind of stories end up defining the woman as a victim only. How did you do that? I know how you did it. Like it's, you did it in an amazing way. I want you to talk us through the, the challenge. Yeah, so one of the things that I was left feeling very uncomfortable with after my dad's trial was the fact that when my mum's story, whenever my mum's story emerged or surfaced during the proceedings, it didn't describe the person that I knew. Um, victims of crime, female victims of crime in particular, and then on top of that, Muslim women are seen to be meek, passive, uh, lacking agency. So they don't have self-awareness. We just do things like because someone told us to rather than because we want to. And I could think of so many instances in my mum's life where that that's not who she was at all. My mum raised four children in this country where she was um, struggling against not just those contextual issues, but personal barriers, a difficult to live with partner who was coercive and controlling in a lot of subtle ways. She learned the language. She went to TAFE. She was enrolled in university at the time of the murder. She was a drug and alcohol clinician at St. Vincent's Hospital counselling people. She was one of two um, Arabic speaking counsellors on the quit line helping people from Arabic speaking backgrounds access important information to quit addiction. Um, she raised the four of us um, despite all of those barriers. And even in the act of getting married and moving overseas, a lot of women who are um, seen as young brides or women who have had arranged marriages, uh, that's also seen as a deficit. But in her decision, I can't imagine a bigger act of hope because she grew up in war and occupation. She was given an opportunity by her family to marry someone who presented quite well at the time. And she decided to take that opportunity. And what a big decision to make at the age of 18. And how hopeful is it to believe that you can go and you can leave your family and you can get out of war and build something better for yourself? at such a young age when that's actually a terrifying decision. So I don't see my mum as weak or passive. I don't see my grandmother as weak or passive. I think that they both exercised amazing creative degrees of um, agency and resilience and also a lot of resistance. And the literature that's emerging now is that all victims of abuse exercise resistance, even if we read about them as being passive or not fighting back or not doing the right thing at a certain time or whatever, um, they're exercising resistance in their own way. And I'm really interested in how we make sure that that comes through when we talk about violence against women. So we're at the end of the session, unless you had any final remarks. So I want to thank our amazing, I mean, they're just amazing. I could listen to them all day, writers. 